So when I was a graduate student, there was this really exciting time happening where the human genome was going to be sequenced, and this was a really, really big deal. In fact, people would have livid fights over how many genes are there in the human genome. Is it 10,000? Is it 100,000? And, and people would get red in the face and argue about this. And we took a project where we developed a tool to go in and see what, uh, how many genes there might be in the genome. Um, when the, and what we found was quite surprising that there's tons of RNA. Um, throughout the genome, yet the conclusion of the Human Genome Project was that we're probably only using about 2% of it, and we have the same number of genes as a fruit fly. And so us and several others really went to look into these other regions of the genome outside of that 2% and say, what else might be out here? Could we find anything that, that looks like a gene? And in that process of thinking, we took it to an extreme and said, well, the junkiest junk of the junk are these hopping genes, right? These genes that uh, Barbara McClintock found and the reason why corn kernels are different colors on the different things is that a DNA will copy itself and its only job is to hop in somewhere else in the genome. And so th this was you know, one of my favorite scientific findings that there's DNA can replicate itself and jump around um, in, in real time. In fact, as we're sitting here, there's parts of my DNA are being activated and jumping around as we speak. Um, and so we were fascinated by this phenomenon that, okay, why would the genome let these things jump around? This could have one of three results. One, it could land somewhere and have no effect, be totally neutral, and stick around. Um, and that's probably what happens a lot of the time because half of the genome is hopping genes, or relics of these hopping genes. Half. So they've been very good at jumping around and surviving. And um, then the other result could be it could land somewhere bad, um, and that might hurt the cell, but hopefully that would be eliminated by the body's natural defense mechanisms against mutations like that. The third possibility is they're doing something good. And nobody really, I, I mean, I think there's been some effort in trying to figure out what the good things are that they could be doing. And what this recent study shows is that actually these hopping genes might be a way of evolving new genes. That this little piece of DNA, if it hops somewhere good, the cell will say, I like this, I'll make a gene here and now I'm better off because of that hopping event. So jumping genes or transposable elements come in all kinds of varieties, but we found that there was one type of jumping gene that was doing something very, very interesting in a stem cell. And what we found is that protein coding genes absolutely will not let this happen. They don't want these jumping genes in them. They're completely against this process. These guys are amenable to it, these RNA genes in the non-coding region. And so what we found is that these hopping genes will land right at the start of a new RNA gene. And this happened 127 times. That's quite striking in and of itself. But what was more surprising is that when we looked at where these were expressed, it was only in stem cells. And this is peculiar for two reasons. One, the odds of one event landing in the same spot that many times and having that specific of an expression pattern to only be in a stem cell, this should be enough. But it gets weirder in the fact that these things should be shut off in a stem cell. In fact, stem cells are great at shutting down hopping genes. Um, so it's quite bizarre that this one type, the endogenous retrovirus, escapes this mechanism, is actually being advantageous in creating new RNA genes that could maybe be used in the stem cell for important biology. Consistent with that, we reported uh, a year and a half ago that one of these uh, genes, with one of these hopping genes right in its start site here, was critical during reprogramming from a human skin cell into a human stem cell for personalized IPS generation. And that's actually where we got our first hit, is that we had seen one, and we thought it was quite bizarre that it was there like that. And then we saw that seven of our ten candidates also had it. And then we went we looked genome-wide, it was 127 of them. This really indicates a unique process where hopping genes can be evolving genes that are very important um, in, in pluripotency, like the one we had previously reported. So now we, get, we can start thinking about trying to evolve our own new genes with this guy um, and start using this in sort of a synthetic biology approach to better understand what it could mean as a tool for reprogramming and under better understanding uh, pluripotency biology. Um, so we, we were thinking about introducing this and seeing if it makes reprogramming more efficient, um, letting evolution 
proceed as it would by enforcing this guy to be expressed and see if we can induce stem cell specific genes, um, as well as understanding what some of the other um, hopping genes might be doing in other tissues. Um, that could be that this is not limited to stem cells. Um, and it could be indicating specificity of these long non-coding RNA genes in all kinds of other tissues and, and um, types. And if we can figure that out, we can think about taking a stem cell to a stem cell, finding other ways of evolving muscle-specific or brain-specific or liver-specific um, uh, cell types by engineering with maybe some of these transposable elements.